Good evening, I'm DK Ross. Now, welcome back to the TTT News. In a time where more than ever the term comorbidities is being used, we are happy to go in-depth on the work of the Chest and Heart Association of Trinidad and Tobago. For that, we are joined by Director Dr. Randolph Rollins and the Treasurer, Kenrick Novi. Greetings, Dr. Rollins and Mr. Nobby. Thank you so much for making the time. And Mr. Nobby, I want to start off with you, thanks. Tell us a little bit about the Heart and Chest Association of Trinidad and Tobago, please. Well, as you may know, the Chest and Heart Association and its predecessor organizations have been around for 116 years this year. So there's a fair amount of history um, if you go back in time. But at the very beginning in the 1905, tuberculosis was a major issue, health issue in Trinidad and other parts of the world. And there was a very lot of concern here in Trinidad. And um, doctors led by Dr. George Masso were very concerned and they were pushing for more and improved um, health, uh, public health um, services. However, they felt the need was there to have an association which was formed. It was called the Trinidad Association for the Prevention of Tuberculosis, Treatment of Prevention and Treatment of Tuberculosis. It consisted of himself and other colleagues and members of society. They found some space to set up a dispensary, what was called a dispensary, and uh, Service Center in Port of Spain on the corner of St. Vincent and Knox Streets. One of the bigger problems that caused this outbreak and of um, tuberculosis was the poor housing arrangements, especially in Port of Spain. As you might know, in those days, Port of Spain was not as was not as it is now, but certainly home to many people in barrack type housing. So Housing was very uh, minimal, if you like, and people were forced into living in very close quarters with each other. In fact, they were saying that some of the housing units measured no more than 10 by 10 and housed three generations of um, people. So that actually contributed a lot to the thing, the poor ventilation and whatnot. And at that, at that time, to the mortality rate, but those contracting tuberculosis were said to be in excess of 60%. Interestingly, one of the measures that was adopted to discourage um, people from spitting outside, because that was one of the major factors, they thought, in um, the spread of the disease. In fact, I remember as a child in the, in the 50s seeing signs of poetry and say, please do not spit on the street. Every time, as time went along, <clears throat> the, there was improvement in the public health facilities. And in the late 40s, the, you had the establishment of a um, hospital in Long Stupula, as well as the Coral Hospital came along in 1950. In the early 50s also, the government needed space that was occupied by the association in Portland Spain to the extend the court and the association in turn needed more space to carry out its uh, functions. They had to identify a uh, location at Rice Road and Port of Spain. And after a lot of discussions, <clears throat> they were granted the use of that space, which is on Rice Road, right next to the licensing office, and which is still occupied today. And we want to thank, and we want to thank you for that. We want to thank you for that overview, but we also want to bring uh, Dr. Rollins into the conversation, please. And Dr. Rollins, one of the things that we're hearing about uh, is, the, is the term comorbidities. We're hearing non-communicable diseases about what does heart health, to your experience, look like during this pandemic? What are some of the things that you're hearing? What are some of the things that you're thinking about? Okay. The first thing I would like to say is um, the pandemic would be considered for a number of people to be the public health challenge, certainly of their lifetime. What we know from the data is that 
give patients with heart conditions during the pandemic at increased risk for more severe COVID infections, as well as the outcome for those who become infected may be variable. There is projected increased mortality, increased complication rates, increased morbidity. And these are some of the things that are impacting the practitioners. Certainly in terms of uh, successful treatment of heart conditions, early diagnosis is critical. And data from the United States and worldwide data has shown you there is good data which has been published in the American College of Cardiology and that has shown that researchers looked at over 800 or 900 centers and over 100 uh, in 100 countries. And what they found during the pandemic are a number of things I summarized. One, they found their challenges with accessing care. The second thing they found is some individuals are not presenting themselves for care. In certain areas, there may be some scaling back you know, of care, providing more emergency type facilities. The number of investigations being performed, um, there has been a reduction between 40 and 65% of some heart investigations in different parts of the world. And also, this is likely to impact what heart health would look like going forward. So what we need uh, would be resource allocation, not re reallocation, but adequate allocation, but also to create unique strategies, which would in include things like digital health, um, telemedicine, um, online consultations, electronic prescribing, things that can enable clients and patients to stay connected during the pandemic so that they're not negatively impacted. But we also need to encourage them to come forward and receive their treatment and their investigations during the pandemic. This is critical. All right, but how easy is it to have that level of connection virtually, Dr. Rollins? Because one of the things, uh, it, it, it may help to a certain point to be able to do some things remotely, but with regard to that early detection, or uh, even there may be somebody who doesn't know they have an issue, how, the, how does it work? And I'll ask that in terms of getting into the association, contacting the association, or a medical service provider to make sure that you are heart healthy. So what, uh, what we need is a good hybrid model. So a model where people are not intimidated, you know, to present themselves to their public health services, their facilities, or to their private practitioners, as the case may be, but also to have the availability in the event that is not possible to utilize alternative means. Um, what we have seen from the data, which I, I, I alluded to a while ago, um, in high-income countries, there was more uptake of, of alternative strategies rather than presenting themselves. So initially for the first consultation, maybe that can occur virtually. And depending on the assessments and so on, then individuals can be encouraged to come forward. So, so a hybrid, a sort of a balance between different models. There will be instances where individuals do need to present themselves for the investigations, but you want to encourage them sufficiently so that they are not intimidated. They are not uh, the fear of, uh, of, of contracting COVID within the hospitals. You can allay those fears. And also you can give them you know, assurances based on the protocols and so on that would have been placed, been put in place in the various institutions. All right, so we thank you for that. We actually take a short break at this point in time. When we return, 
we have a beautiful feature and we continue the conversation from there with chat the chest and heart association of trinidad and tobago stay with us It can happen in the blink of an eye. A heart attack is a life-threatening medical emergency. And according to cardiothoracic surgeon Dr. Randolph Rollins, diseases of the heart and circulatory system are wreaking havoc worldwide. Data from the World Health Organization and also from the CDC would verify that there are approximately 17 million, um, 17 million people die from, from cardiovascular diseases every year, okay? Cardiovascular disease, 70% of those individuals would also have non-communicable diseases. Non-communicable diseases being what we speak of, diabetes, high blood pressure, elevated cholesterol, those types of um, conditions. So Heart attacks occur for many reasons, including a blockage in one or more of the coronary arteries. This resulting lack of blood and oxygen is a fatal combination. Heart is made up of different components. So you've got muscular component, you've got valves within the heart. The heart has an electrical or conduction system. So symptoms really pertain to which of the component is primarily affected. And what cardiovascular disease really is, is about diseases of the heart, as well as circulatory system or the blood vessels associated with it. He lists some warning signs which should not be ignored. Dysrhythmias or arrhythmias, irregular heartbeats. So sometimes you may, a person may complain of fast heartbeat, tachycardia, or slow heartbeat, bradycardia. Other symptoms include angina or chest pain, pain radiating towards the neck, shoulder, and jawline, back pain, tingling and numbness in the arm, shortness of breath, sweating, fatigue, swollen legs and ankles, vomiting, feeling lightheaded, and dizzy spells. Without regular checkups, a cardiac episode could catch you off guard. Up to 45% of individuals present no signs of a heart attack, and they may be described as what we call silent heart attack. It's silent because either the symptoms are not as pronounced, and sometimes they may ignore the symptoms. What we want is to get people eating healthy, um, low salt, low fat, low cholesterol diets. Also increasing the amount of uh, fruit and vegetables that are part of their diet. It is also recommended individuals should at least have approximately 150 minutes of moderate exercise weekly. This cardiothoracic surgeon hopes more people take time out to see about their health by engaging in lifestyle modifications before it's too late. And welcome back. This is In Depth with me, DK Roster. We are speaking with Dr. Randolph Rawlins, Director of the Chest and Heart Association, as well as Treasurer, Mr. Kenrick Nobby. And Dr. Rawlins, I want to, you spoke about it a little bit in that feature in terms of early warning signs. But I want to ask you to expand on that a little bit. And my reason is that it doesn't always seem as though you can tell whether or not someone's heart is in a good working condition from the way they look. There's some people who they're going to the gym, they're doing the most, they have all this energy, they're exercising. And when you hear the show, heart attack. So what are some of those things that we need to be mindful of? Okay, so a number of people, uh, unfortunately, ignore their symptoms. Sometimes they're not aware of their symptoms. But some of the common, some of the common signs and symptoms may be, as was mentioned previously, angina. Angina is chest pains, which is brought on by exertion and relieved by rest. So the person may experience pains when they're exercising, when they're doing their normal activities, climbing stairs, etc., And this is because there is a mismatch between blood supply and the blood that is required. 
So angina may be the first symptoms, may be a first symptom. Shortness of breath, that is another one which is common. If you are uh, used to or accustomed performing a certain level of activity and you find over time that you're able to walk a shorter distance, you're becoming breathless. It may not be just because you are, you are, this is part of the aging process. It may be because there is something wrong with your heart. Irregular heartbeats, we mentioned, these are not uncommon. And some of those heartbeats may be speeding up. They may be faster than usual, tachycardias. They may be slower than usual. And this is because of, uh, you know, deficits within the conduction system of the heart. Nighttime disturbances is another important one. Some, some individuals may find, you know, they go to bed comfortably, but then they are awoken in the middle of the night, difficulty breathing. They would have to sit on the edge of the bed. Those who are close in proximity to windows sometimes, if they open the window, you know, get a bit of fresh air, that, uh, seem to improve their symptoms. Or on, on other occasions, individuals may be sleeping with two or three pillows being unable to lie flat. These are all signs of, of heart conditions. Swollen ankles, we mentioned before. And uh, you know, these are by, you know, some of the more common signs, they're not exhaustive at this point, but if you have got any of those symptoms, fluttering of the heart, that may be another one. These may be reasons for a person to come forward for further investigations. And in terms of coming forward for that further investigation, I want you to stress the importance or ask you how important is it to come forward for that further investigation? Because I can, I can easily see someone saying, okay, well, normally I'm able to do this amount of work and I'm not able to do that amount. Boy, this pandemic licking me up, boy, I lost my condition where it might not necessarily be a matter of physical conditioning, but an issue that they have otherwise. So how important is it to get that, 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 further, that further investigation of the condition? Further investigation is, is critical because it may be the only uh, opportunity for you to really uh, assess what is happening. And when we speak about further investigation, I want to say this investigation should be guided. So as part of the investigation strategy, individuals are encouraged to have consultations with their physicians, with their doctors. This may be the first opportunity to, you know, to really understand what your risk profile might be and whether or not you're a candidate who is considered high risk or intermediate risk or low risk and I want to ask about the connection between heart disease and strokes, as well as some of possibly those risk factors connected to heart disease, please, Dr. Rollins. When we speak of stroke, there are two main types of strokes we speak of. So stroke is an event which occurs in the brain. And it usually would result in a form of neurological deficit, meaning the person may have some interruption or dysfunction of their ability to perform certain, certain tasks. Some strokes can be mild, some may be more severe and may result in, in permanent disability. That being the case, um, there are two main types of strokes hemorrhagic strokes, which result from bleeds within the brain, or what we call ischemic strokes, where there is an interruption of blood flow. And that can occur uh, from um, obstruction within the blood vessels supplying the brain. Now, conditions which result within, specifically to heart, disease, conditions which result in clot formation within the heart can result in strokes. And what may, what might those conditions be? So if a person has what we describe as a weak heart, 
So say a person has had uh, an extensive heart attack, extensive myocardial infarction, and it has damaged the heart muscle. That heart muscle now is less efficient, less effective in pumping blood around the body. So there is a, uh, a, like a pooling of blood within the heart. Um, stasis is the medical term. So the blood is not flowing around the chambers of the heart as efficiently, and that allows clots to form within the heart. Now, depending on where those clots are, if those clots become dislodged, then one of the first territory that could be affected would be the brain. And therefore, you can result in, you can have a stroke as a result of clot formation within the heart. The other thing is um, individuals who have got um, problems with their heart, maybe clot also, who are on certain medication to dissolve those clots. It is important that those medications are kept within what we would call a, a, a therapeutic range, a specific range. So you would need to have for some individuals, depending on what medication, they need to have a blood test ever so often to ensure that you do not exceed the range or you are not below the range because either of those circumstances can result in a catastrophic events within the brain resulting in strokes. The other big um, factor I want to mention is atrial fibrillation. That one, uh, you know, is common. Most people would probably hear that about 30% of individuals over time, especially as you become more elderly, can develop atrial fibrillation. But if you have also got certain conditions affecting heart, heart valves, the way the valves function within the heart, that can also result in atrial fibrillation and potentially um, a risk of stroke. All right, thank you so much. And Mr. Norby, we didn't forget you, but we're asking, as we close, how do individuals contact the association to get some of the information to be educated that you have? All right, Mr. Norby? Okay, well, there, there, Mr. Mr. Norby might be able to Not a problem. as well. Yes. Uh, they can contact the association at 625-2805. That's 625-2805. And or drop to the office at 13 Ryston Road, right next to the licensing office, and make a request. We also will be glad to accommodate requests when the pandemic is over for uh, outreach programs to be done, basic screening, like right. blood pressures, sugars, um, BMI, and cholesterol testing. Thank you so much, Mr. Nobby, as well as Dr. Rollins. And on behalf of the entire TTT News team, we want to thank you all. Once again, Dr. Randolph Rollins, the Director of Chest and Heart Association, as well as Treasurer Kenrick Nobby. And thank you for tuning into In Depth with me, 